Hello, everybody. Yes, I am Zoe. I am the one that quit everything and became a dog trainer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what I want to do today is kind of talk about uh, scent work, um, how you can work with your dog in the woods, help you find mushrooms. Um, I'm also going to talk about some of the benefits of scent work. We're going to talk about truffle dogs, the history of truffle dogs, and all that kind of jazz. Okay. All right. So who am I? What gives me the right to tell you all about this? Um, so like my mom said, I work for a company called Pavlov Dog Training in Denver. Um, I've been working with them for a little over a year now, full time. And I went to a school in Texas, before that called Starmark Dog Training Academy. And there I learned all sorts of different things. I of course learned about obedience training and behavior modification, which is what I do now. So mostly like obedience with puppies, adult dogs, that kind of thing, but behavior modification is in reactivity, aggression, OCD behaviors, stuff like that as well. So um, I've got a little bit of experience everywhere. Now at Starmark, I learned a lot more about sports and all sorts of things that you can do with your dog, um, whether it's in a working capacity or in a pet dog capacity. I learned about um, agility. I did a lot of agility with one of my dogs. I learned about search and rescue, so how to train search and rescue, rescue dogs. I learned about uh, police protection. So I did some bite work with dogs, literally teaching dogs how to bite, <laughs> um, as well as teaching dogs to like smell out drugs and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. So super fun. So I've got a little bit of experience everywhere. And since then, I've also done some competitions with my own dogs, mostly in obedience, but I'm starting to do some more scent work and I'm gonna do a herding competition with one of my dogs soon as well. That's a thing, you can get titles for having your dog herd sheep. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, my mom has been a part of this club for a super long time. And when I was a kid, I like didn't know what it was about. I thought it was kind of lame <laughs> being a kid. But after she took me uh, to enough forays, I realized how awesome mushrooms are. And I thoroughly enjoyed learning about them, going to different classes, going to Telluride Mushroom Festival. It like, changed my life. Um, and we all bring our dogs with us. So I was like, how can I combine my experience with something that I love? So we're gonna get into that. So I first wanna talk about um, generally like how we know what mushrooms smell like, right? So um, let's get into that. So generally when we find a mushroom in the forest, the first thing that we're gonna do is usually put it up to our nose and smell it because they smell so good. You know, chanterelles kind of smell like apricots, agaricus kind of smell like almonds, stinkhorns smell like poo. <laughs> um, it's interesting actually, stinkhorns smell so bad to actually attract, uh, attract bugs to them so that they'll uh, spread their spores elsewhere, which is kind of interesting. Now, knowing what I know about dogs, I'm thinking if we can smell them from close up, I guarantee you a dog can smell them from literally a mile away. So. Uh, so how exactly do dogs smell? So fun fact, um, I learned this recently actually. I'm shocked that I didn't know this before. Dogs instinctively smell only out of their right nostril when they first come across a new smell. The only time that they use both nostrils is when the smell is pleasant or when they're trained to think that that smell is pleasant, right? Just kind of cool, right? So now I'm like, I'm sitting on my couch watching my dogs like smell everything in the air and I'm like, which nostril are they using? <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool. Um, some breeds are better at finding scents than others, but there isn't a lot of research out there that proves one way or, the, or another that a specific breed is really good at scent work. Um, we're gonna talk about Legatos, which are a breed that is literally specifically bred to find truffles. Um, we, we know bloodhounds, right? Bloodhounds are really good at finding stuff and they have been proven to have more scent receptors than other types of breeds. However, a big part of that is actually their anatomy and that their ears are so long. And when they're trailing, they're actually picking up the scent on the ground and bringing it closer to their nose. So it's not even necessarily how many scent receptors they have, it's just that they've got really cool ears. <laughs> Um, so on average, dogs have 100 million scent receptors versus humans that only have 6 million. So you can imagine how much easier it would be for dogs to find certain scents, but they're also able to pick up scents that humans literally can't. Dogs also have what's called the Jacobson's organ. And this kind of sits below 
their nasal cavity and above the roof of their mouth. And this organ gives them the ability to detect undetectable scents to humans, right? So um, this kind of works in combination with the rest of their olfactory system so that they're able to detect things like, um, for instance, like hormones in humans, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and this also gives them the ability to smell underwater. So your dog can literally go underwater, open its mouth and smell what's underneath the, the water, which is kind of, kind of freaky. <laughs> um, so dogs can smell all sorts of things that we know about. They can detect male versus female, but not just in their own breed. They can also do this with humans and other breeds as well. They can detect certain emotions in humans. So yes, they literally can detect if somebody's pregnant or sad or hormonal, <laughs> right? By literally smelling the hormones that secrete from your pores. Uh, they can smell different types of cancers and viruses. Um, so that clickbait that you clicked on during COVID that told you that dogs were being trained to smell out coronavirus, that's true. Um, they can do that. They can smell out lots of different types of viruses too. So it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, another thing that I found out after I became a dog trainer and almost went into this field was that there are lots of dogs that are actually trained to detect certain invasive species of plants, bugs, and animals. So companies will hire these, uh, these canine teams to go out and be like, hey, you know, I think I have some kind of invasive species on my property that's maybe killing my livestock or whatever it may be or killing the forest or something and they can send a dog out there to detect if it's actually there. Um, some of you might know that there's dogs out there that are trained to detect bed bugs, right? They'll go into hotels, we'll hire them, and they'll go room to room and detect if there's bed bugs in there. So, pretty crazy. Um, of course, we know about police dogs being able to detect drugs and explosives, but it goes even beyond that. There are dogs out there that are trained to smell out cell phone batteries. Um, they'll go to cargo, like shipment containers, and smell out specific types of batteries, specific types of explosives, right? Dogs can detect like the craziest differences between even different types of drugs, right? A dog that's trained to sniff out cocaine won't hit on meth, um, whatever other drugs are out there, right? They'll only detect cocaine. Um, in live search and rescue dogs, so live meaning they're going out and finding people that are alive, maybe hurt, maybe lost. Um, big deal in Colorado, right? We've got people, um, you know, getting lost all the time in the woods. But the way that they do this is fascinating. This is one of my favorite things to learn about in dog training school. So what happens is whenever we take a step, and it doesn't matter if we are fully clothed, we are constantly shedding dead skin particles, even on top of our clothing, right? Every time, every time we take a step, I'm shedding skin particles onto the ground. And dogs can pick that up. They can smell your dead skin particles based on just once smelling maybe a piece, a piece of clothing that you wore several days ago. And they can pick up a trail that's maybe hours or even days old, depending on the weather conditions. So they're, they're capable of quite a bit. <laughs> so I think mushrooms won't be too, <laughs> too hard of a job for them. So let's, let's now talk about the history of truffle dogs because we all know about truffles. I think most of us know that there are a lot of dogs out there that are trained to uh, you know, sniff out truffles. That's really all we know as far as dogs finding mushrooms in general. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. So truffle hunting in general dates, dates back to the fourth century BC, but it became a lot more common in the 14 and 1500s. What's interesting though, is it was actually the lower class people, the peasants that would go out and find truffles to make their food taste better. It wasn't the royalty that started um, using truffles in their food until the 17, 1800s when they became a part of the spice trade and therefore they then skyrocketed in value. Before the 18th century, pigs were often used to find truffles. And the problem with pigs is that they have very little impulse control. They're super smart, they're super good at finding things, uh, but when they find one, they might also eat it. <laughs> right? So there goes all your profit. The nice thing about dogs is they're a lot better at being taught what impulse control is. Um, so for instance, like with my dogs, I've, I've taught them to never pick things up off the ground. I can literally drop a raw steak on the ground and they'll look at me and they're not gonna even think about going for it, right? So they have impulse control, which is a nice thing about finding anything in the woods. <laughs> you'll get there, you'll get there, I promise. <laughs> Puppies are hard. Um, so 
Before the 18th century, there was kind of a whole category of dogs that were found in Southern Europe where truffle hunting was very common. Um, they're kind of like these small poodle type dogs. So they, they kind of look like poodles with different coloration. They're kind of a combination of like a Portuguese water dog and other types of small water dogs. Um, but they were used for everything. They were used for scent work, like we're gonna be doing today. Um, they were used to haul supplies, haul carts, um, to retrieve game, you know, birds uh, that they would shoot out in the field. Um, and it wasn't until the 18th century where a guy in Europe decided that he was gonna take the best of the best in scent work of that type of dog and make his own breed. And that's called legatos. I still to this day don't know how to say that second word. I'm gonna guess Romagnolo, but I don't know. I've, I've worked with them and I still don't know how to say it. Um, but they're, they're interesting. They're like a 25, 30, 30 pound dog. Um, and you know, yeah, they're bred to find truffles, but we'll talk about here in a second why that doesn't mean that every single one of them is gonna be good at it. Uh, just because they're bred to do it doesn't make them good at it. So um, in general, as you probably been able to tell right now, there's not a lot of research out there as far as if dogs are able to detect specific types of mushrooms and mostly because it just hasn't really been done. Um, there's some YouTube videos out there. People say, hey, my German Shepherd can, you know, sniff morels uh, out, but um, there's not a lot of proof of that. But I would say after learning about all of this, you guys can imagine why I, I think that they're pretty, pretty well capable of differentiating between different types of mushrooms. If we can put, you know, a chanterelle and an agaricus next to each other and distinctly tell the difference between their smells as a human, dogs can do it from a mile away. So um, I want to talk about now about the benefits of scent work. Um, so scent work in general is commonly described as this category of working dogs that are able to detect a specific scent indoors or outdoors. Okay. Um, almost every dog thrives from having a job. Almost every dog is also bred to have a job, right? There's the herding breed, um, the guardian livestock, the hunting, um, you know, there's literally a whole category that's called working breeds, right? German Shepherds fit into those. Um, and so giving our dog a job is literally going to fulfill them in life, right? Having them sit around on our couch is not giving them anything to do and it's not giving them the fulfillment that they need, right? So there are also a lot of sports that involve scent work that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, so AKC, the American Kennel Club, is basically the kind of club that oversees all of the breed standards in the U.S. So um, they run a lot of different types of sports. So for instance, agility, right? Almost every agility competition is under AKC. Um, competitive obedience, which is what I do, they're all AKC. Um, all AKC competitions. Um, but there's also a lot of different types of sports. One of my favorites is called barn hunt. Um, it sounds kind of crazy and it's relatively new to the scene, but basically it's a giant room like this, but it's full of hay bales and they take live rats and put the live rats in cages and then they hide the cages underneath the hay and you take your dog and you tell them to search and whoever finds the rat fastest wins, right? Of course, that's based on one dog at a time, but you get the idea. Um, so really cool, right? It's not only using hunting instincts, but also their nose as well. Uh, there's nose work, which is like the kind of general category of scent work. Um, and that, sp they specifically use essential oils. So it's usually, I think like mirth oil is what it's called. Um, and they sew cotton balls in it. And then they do these kind of elaborate setups, right? Where it would be like something like this with cupboards um, and closets and stuff. And they would hide a jar with the mirth oil in it and your dog has to find it. Um, and I've seen all sorts of dogs do nose work specifically. When I was in, in dog training school, the dog that I did with scent work was a boxer, pure red boxer. Short face, right? You wouldn't normally think of, of the, the short nose dogs as being really good at scent work, but they definitely can be. Um, one of my instructors had a titled, like several, several titles on his eight-year-old chihuahua <laughs> in nose work. So <laughs> literally any dog can do nose work. Um, some of you as dog owners have also heard of different types of puzzle games, the talk buttons, lick mats, uh, snuffle mats, 
all that kind of stuff. That's all using their nose as well. It's all using their different senses. Um, snuffle mats would be where you hide the food in a mat and they have to find it. This is also using their brain, right? So I always tell my clients, especially puppy clients, that 60% of the game is mental stimulation, right? You're doing your dog a disservice if all you're doing is basically running them on a treadmill, right? Getting them to work, getting them to work for their food, getting them to work for what they love, um, playing with them, engaging with them, getting their brain going is going to tire your dog, your dog out a hell of a lot faster than it will be if you just put them on a treadmill, right? And I mean treadmill realistically and metaphorically, I guess. <laughs> Um, so scent work, as you'll see here, is kind of using all of those things, right? It's, it's getting them moving, it's getting them interested in what's around them, it's getting their, all of their senses working. So this can be a really, really great way to keep your dog happy and fulfilled. Um, another part of this too that I guess I should mention is that giving your dog a job will also help your, ob your obedience, right? So if you've got a crazy dog that is tearing up your house, probably because they're bored. Um, so giving them a job to do, right? Getting them engaged is going to help your training too. Um, so getting them to kind of a more calm level where training actually sinks in a little bit better and unless they're way up here, right? Is going to, to help your obedience training as well. Okay, so this is the long part. Um, and if you want to take notes, this would probably be where I would take notes um, just cause I'm gonna go through pretty thoroughly um, the, the training process. Uh, this isn't the only way to teach this, but this is going to be the simplest way and with the least amount of tools possible to teach your dog to do this. So um, today we have some dried morels here. Um, you can use dried morels. Uh, you can use any kind of mushroom, right? And this isn't even mushrooms. You can technically use whatever the hell you want um, for your dog to smell, but we're going to talk about mushrooms today. So um, let's say you're using morels. You can use dried fresh or an oil okay so what most people do when they're talking about truffle dogs specifically what most of those uh, people will do is they'll use truffle oil it's the strongest scent and it'll stay for the longest amount of time it's the most bang for your buck it's the strongest scent so i'm sure that you can figure out a way to make an oil or find an oil of another type of mushroom if that's what you want to do otherwise dried is pretty good too i would just say at the very end of your process maybe use a couple fresh ones just to test it out, right? Make sure that they're still hitting on the same scent, but relatively it's, it's all kind of the same. Um, you don't wanna put your mushrooms in plastic. You don't wanna put anything scent-like in plastic, and that's because plastic will absorb the odor. So it's got to be glass, right? If you're gonna put your odor in anything, put it in glass, and if you're not using it, it's sealed. Otherwise, you need to put the lid back on. Okay. And that's with like, even if you're teaching your dog to sniff out drugs, you're still going to do this, right? You're still going to use glass. Um, so what we're going to kind of do today, I mean, we're going to try a couple different things later on, but generally speaking, I've got something small like this, and then I've got a bigger container around it, right? And this first step, I like to use food, but you can also use a toy if you want to. You're going to put the jar inside a bigger container so that when you reward your dog, you're rewarding in the same place as the odor. Right? So you can use even something like this. It's technically a shoe box, but I don't care. Um, right, Where the scent is in the middle, on the side, whatever, they come up, they smell the scent, and you're able to reward exactly where the odor is. We'll talk about that more in detail later on. So having a bigger container with your um, scent will be beneficial, or maybe potentially even multiple bigger containers as well. Okay? Um, as far as your dog goes, First, they need to understand what a marker word is. So a marker you guys have probably heard of is more of like a clicker training type of situation. So when they hear the click of a clicker, you're basically taking a snapshot in their brain that that exact moment is what you're rewarding, right? So as soon as I click, as soon as I say a specific word, they know, oh, that's what got me the treat, right? So for instance, as soon as they smell this, you're going to say your marker word, you're gonna click the clicker, and they know, oh, I should probably try that again because that's what got me the treat. What's right? a marker word? So marker word is just, you could use yes, right? That's what I usually use, yes. Uh, in my training, I use kind of a silly word like bingo um, so, so that it's kind of a little bit more unique to training so that they don't hear it all the time. But it doesn't matter too much. You just have to be consistent with your marker word. Some people just use good, yes, just something simple like that. 
Um, as far as equipment goes, a harness or a wide flat collar, but I definitely recommend more so a harness and we'll get to that here in a little bit as to why that is important. So getting started, the first step here is making an association between the odor and the reward, right? They need to understand that it's smelling the odor that's going to get them a reward, okay? You wanna start this process in more of a calm indoor space. So think living room, garage, something like that. You're not gonna immediately go outside because your dog is gonna be way too jazzed to be outside to focus on anything, right? Um, you can start, like I said, with treats or a toy, but I definitely recommend more food to start with this process just because it's a little bit easier. You can just plop the food in. When you're using a toy, you need to kind of engage with your dog, right? So you're kind of like taking the ball and then like, here's the odor and then here's the ball, <laughs> right? So it's a little bit more tricky, but it's still definitely possible. I've worked dogs on both. Um, so, so either one technically works. Um, okay. So let's kind of talk about the, the actual process of this. So what you're gonna do first is you're gonna take your jar, you're gonna have your treats in maybe a treat pouch, um, you're gonna have them behind you, not like readily available in your hand, right? And all you're gonna do is you're just gonna put this out, maybe in your hand, maybe a little bit closer to the ground, and you're just gonna see if they come up to it and smell it, all right? That's all, that's all you want. And as soon as your dog does, you're gonna mark first, right? You're gonna say, Yes, as soon as you see those nostrils flaring and then you get them the reward right at the scent, okay? So again, super simple. We're just making an association here. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a possibility that your, your dog confuses the treats that you have with the scent of the mushroom? Sure, so it's definitely possible. Now, the reason why you want to reward here at Odor though is because your dog will come up to you and they might like look at the scent and then they're gonna look back up at you, right? Cause they're so used to getting the reward from you. So that's why you want this to be right next to each other. However, that's why I say have the treats back here, right? They don't know that you have the reward readily available. They have to smell it first, then you mark, right? You mark with your yes, then you give the reward, right? So they need to hear that marker word before they get the reward. Otherwise, they're gonna get all sorts of confused, like you're saying. Um, oh God, what was my train of thought? I know, you just wanna work, I get it, me too. Um, okay, so you're gonna kinda do this over and over again, right? And your dog is eventually going to get the whole point that this is what you want them to interact with. However, you want to see those nostrils moving. Your dog will fake you out, and not even on purpose. Your dog might think that you want them to boop it with their nose, right? You want to see them make an effort to smell this, right? You wanna see those nostrils moving. If they're not, they're faking you out and these next steps are not gonna work for you, okay? You're gonna do several repetitions like this, right? You can do maybe one or two sessions like this usually until you can start kind of moving on. Um, but you wanna see them like really super stoked about these. Like this scent is the best thing in the world to your dog, okay? So now we wanna put it on cue. This basically just means that we want to give the search command, right? You can technically use anything. You can use find it, you can use search, you can use bologna, bananas, I don't care. Whatever you wanna say is fine. Um, this part is where another person is going to be helpful, so a human helper, and a harness is also going to be helpful. So basically, you're gonna have your human helper holding your dog back, right? And you're, we're still in a, kind of an indoor environment at this point. So you have your human helper holding your dog back and you're gonna go, you're gonna, you're gonna show them the scent. You might show them you have food too, but it's not a big deal. You're going to set the jar down right in front of them and you're going to say your search command and that's when your human helper can release the dog. As soon as they find the scent, yes, mark and reward, okay? Now, it's good if your dog is freaking out, okay? It's good if your dog is barking, if they're excited, if they're ready to go, if they're jazzed, it's okay. You want them to be agitated. That's one of the reasons why I like to use a harness for this because harnesses can actually agitate your dogs. I hate to tell people that because some people think the opposite, but if I'm holding that harness back, they're feeling that pressure and dogs have opposition reflex, which, which means they're gonna pull into pressure, right? And they're gonna be like ready to go. They're frustrated, they're agitated, and we want that. We want them to be really excited about this process. 
So you're gonna do a few different repetitions of this and this is when you can start to kind of test them and see if they're really hitting on scent or if they're faking you out. So maybe you know, you're in your living room or something, your human helper is back there and maybe you have them turn your dog around this time. And you're gonna maybe put the scent behind the couch. Not like in a crazy space. It needs to be easy still. We're still at the easy part, right? Are you excited? You wanna find it? Are you ready to go? <laughs> um, and so that's when, now we're gonna give the search cue. Your human helper is going to let that dog go and as soon as they find it, again, mark and reward um, at the scent, okay? And by the way, if you guys have questions, you can ask now, but we, you guys can also ask questions at the end. Um, okay, so again, several repetitions of this, but this is when we start to get to more of the hiding part of it. You want to add an alert behavior. So this basically just means this is what your dog is going to do when they actually find the scent out in the real world, out in the forest. Um, I prefer a bark. Right, because if my dog's out in the woods and they find it and I don't know where they are because there's trees everywhere, I want to be able to hear them. Um, this is really honestly pretty easy. So all you're going to do is do everything the exact same that I just told you, but before you reward, so it, you're gonna mark, you're gonna say yes as soon as they find odor, but before you give them that reward, you ask them for the behavior that you want. Okay, so it could be a sit, a down, a paw, um, a rollover, a bark, whatever you want it to be, you ask for that behavior. As soon as they perform the behavior, that's when they get the reward, okay? Um, so I know that a lot of you probably don't know how to teach your dogs to, how to bark. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. Every dog is a little bit different, but let me tell you the way that I taught my dog how to bark on command it's honestly really cute and I love it. <laughs> and this can actually make it a little bit easier if your dog has a problem with barking, sometimes teaching them when to bark can help you turn it off sometimes when they're not supposed to be, right? Uh, so the way that I taught my dog to do this, one of my dogs to do this, basically like pissed him off. <laughs> so I was kind of like, I would stand there and I would kind of mess with him, right? I would kind of like, what you do? What you, and I would like talk to him and like, be, like literally I would, I would like piss him off and get him agitated. And the second he let out a bark, I stopped everything and said yes and rewarded. I like threw food at him. And I did it again. I would kind of mess with him, right? And he, but he was a lot faster the second time because he was like something that I did there got me something, right? <laughs> Pavlov conditioning, it works, right? So he was like something that I did work. So he would get agitated a little bit faster. He'd bark again and I'd reward. And I kept doing that until he was literally just like sitting there barking at me. And I was like, cool, we're there now. Um, so in that same session, <coughs> excuse me, in that same session, what I would do is just add a cue to it, right? So I would just be standing there before I knew he was about to bark at me. I would say my command, which is talk shit. <laughs> I would say talk shit. And then he would start, you know, he would bark and then I'd reward. And so now I say talk shit and he starts barking like a, like a madman. So um, that's basically how I taught it. So if that's what you would wanna do, it would be the same process. You teach the behavior first, then when you're doing your scent training, as soon as they find the scent, you mark yes first. That's important because you're marking this. You're marking the scent first, then you ask for the behavior and what's eventually going to happen is enough times of doing that, enough times of offering the behavior or, or telling them what behavior to do, they're going to start to offer it, right? They're going to start to do the behavior before you ask for it. Again, Pavlov conditioning, works every time, right? Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so basically you're looking for that behavior to become consistent before you have to ask for it. So we're at the last, the last part, the last stage, which is generalization, right? This is the fun part where you start to go, you start getting out in the woods and doing all of this in more real time. So you're not going to go from like your backyard to the forest and just expect your dog to like find mushrooms. Dogs are not good at generalizing, right? So if you teach a behavior just in general in your living room and you only ever practice in your living room and then you go to Home Depot and you expect your dog to do the same thing, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy, right? Cause they don't understand that change in picture very quickly, right? They need, subtle changes. So at this point, before you're going out in the forest, you should be in your backyard, the local park that they've been to before, your front yard, 
where you're outside and you're practicing setups, but you're not at that point where you're like, you're going from your living room to the forest, okay? Once you get to that point, once you start getting to the setup point, this could be your backyard, an outdoor environment, or the actual forest. Um, basically what you're gonna do, you're gonna find kind of an open area and you're gonna do everything the same, but you're gonna take this scent and you're going to genuinely hide it, okay? Not super hard. You don't wanna make it super hard too quickly. You wanna think maybe like a 20, 20 foot radius from where your dog is, is where you wanna start. Your dog's here, a human helper again comes in handy so that one person can kind of hold your dog back and can't look at you, right? So maybe somebody's distracting your dog, um, you know, they, they're kind of off in their own world. You go and hide the scent, maybe just in the grass, right? And you're just taking your jar at this point. You don't need like the whole other container. You're just taking the jar, hiding the jar, and giving them the search command. If they find it, sweet. You reward as normal. But basically what you're gonna do, because once you're in the forest, you're not gonna like have a whole container, like that's not how that works. Um, so you're just gonna start rewarding at the scent, right? So they find it, good. And you can just bring your hand out or you can just plop the reward on the ground itself, okay? You're gonna start to expand your circle out. If your dog is failing, it's because you went too fast. So if at any of these stages, if your dog is not doing well and they're confused, you need to go back a step. And honestly, I tell all of my clients that with everything. If you're failing in obedience, if something went wrong, go back to the basics. Teach them everything with treats again. Go back to positive reinforcement, just treats. It's the same deal. With this, it's the exact same thing. Go back to the basics if your dog is struggling at any specific point. Um, once you get to this point though, you're gonna start expanding your circle out. So you're at 20 feet, you're at 100 feet, you're at 200 feet. You're doing like, you're literally walking into the forest, hiding the scent, coming back, giving your dog a search cue. Again, I recommend a harness and I recommend a long line. So instead of a six foot leash, your dog is going to pull you so hard the whole time. And that's cool, that's fine. We want them to do that. That's why the harness is there because we want them to pull and we want them to feel like they can go wherever they need to to find the scent. However, a long line is gonna make your life a little bit easier. A long line could be a 10 foot leash, a 20 foot leash, or a 30 foot leash. You can make one yourself, you can go out and buy one, doesn't matter. Um, but at that point, that's what I would probably recommend. Um, so keep doing test runs. You can maybe do this once or twice out in the forest in different environments, and then you're ready. You're ready to, to test it out for real. Um, so it, it kind of sounds like a long process, and sometimes it can be, right? I've taught dogs on full scent in three days, but I also did it like all day <laughs> when I was in school, right? That's literally all I did. So if you wanna do this in a time frame that makes sense to you, designate 15, 20 minutes a day, right? And again, this is not only for you to be able to find mushrooms easier, this is for the benefit of the relationship with you and your dog. So if you don't normally take 15 to 20 minutes out of your day, just to hang out with your dog, this is a great opportunity to do so, right? And going for walks with your dog, I would say doesn't count unless you're actively doing training. And, and I'm not shaming anybody because sometimes I don't have time for that either. But if you want this to work, if you want the training process to work, put in the time. Put in 15, 20 minutes a day. It's not that much time. You get home, you set up your scent, right? They're gonna be finding mushrooms all around your house. And that's exactly what we want. If you never leave your house, that's fine. You can put them on another scent and just get them working. Just get them excited about something, right? That's really all we want. So to conclude, basically what I just said, right? So scent work is super fun. It's challenging and exciting. It gives us the, the time to kind of problem solve with our dog. It gives them the opportunity to problem solve too. Uh, there's, there's just so many benefits to it. And yeah, you know, you can potentially fully train a dog to find morels and you could potentially make like a lot of money or just feel really cool about yourself. <laughs> um, and you can really speed up the process here because I promise you dog noses are much better than human eyeballs. Um, but it's also, it's just, it's just a good time. It's just fun. It's fun to work with your dogs and I want you guys to work with your dogs. So with that being said, any questions? Um, you can ask me questions about what I talked about at the beginning or the training process. And then after this point, um, we're gonna kind of work some dogs here. I'm not totally sure how we're gonna do this, but we're gonna make it work. <laughs> We've got three dogs, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, and we're just gonna kind of get them started. 
Um, I'll give you guys some tips and tricks on what's gonna help like motivate your dogs. You guys don't all have to stay for this process if you don't want to, but um, I'll kind of give you guys some tips and tricks on how to make this process the easiest for your dog and what's gonna help them succeed. So with that, that's all. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, say I'm like the, or the dog dealt with find two different things in the woods to take the difference. So she yep. got a, a shed animal here, and it would also be great to find an Australian. Sure. So do you have different uh, words, different commands for the different items, uh, or is it similar? Yeah, it's, I would say, um, it can get a little tricky, right? They can get kind of confused relatively quickly, especially when you're working with a puppy and you're trying to train them on two active scents. I would say like, if they find a shed, it's because they're a dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they're, they're gonna find dead stuff out there. And that's the thing with this too, is that even with live search and rescue, even with cadaver, right? That, I mean, this is kind of morbid, but um, with cadaver dogs, right? Once they get a taste of human flesh, it kind of, <laughs> messes things up a little bit not to get gruesome but it's the it's the same concept right um you know dogs will find all sorts of different things that you don't want them to find and that's just a part of the process i wouldn't reward it um i would reward it with good boy keep going <laughs> and then move on so basically um with that being said focus on one scent at a time get them really good on one scent at a time once you get them really good on one thing you can move on to another um, and you can try to use different cues, but again, that doesn't guarantee anything. Usually when it comes to dogs that are, you know, if you have like a bed bug dog and you want to transition them to search and rescue, it's going to take you probably like two or three years to get that dog to stop hitting off bed bugs. Cause it's so trained, right? It's like they learn to love the smell of bed bugs. Like they would die for bed bugs, right? Cause they know they're going to get their reward at the end. Um, so so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Does your dog's yeah. age matter? No. Um, I would say no with a comma, um, as long as your dog isn't geriatric. <laughs> if your dog is geriatric and like forgetting where, what room it's in, you've got a problem. Um, but beyond that, like I said, I've seen like an eight-year-old chihuahua win several national titles in nose work. Um, so it really doesn't matter, um, honestly. And I, again, I've seen all sorts of breeds do this too. I really like, you can do this with any dog. Um, terriers are really good at it. I've had a lot of good experiences with terriers in general, but um, yeah. Is, it, um, is there a conflict if your dog is a retriever and is retrieving and then you switch over to mushrooms or you could then have them worked out of the ground and brought back to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, so if anything, it's good that your dog has drive, right? Mm -hmm. So drive is all about what motivates your dog. Talked a lot, I, well, I guess I didn't talk enough about that. Motivation is key. What motivates your dog, right? Does your dog like toys? Does your dog like tug? Um, you know, you can use anything. My little dog, my 10 year old dog would literally like fall over and die because he's so happy because I called him a good boy in the special voice. You're such a good boy. Like he, like he loves praise, just praise, right? But anyway, if your dog has like that good tug drive or they want that ball, use the ball for this. Use the ball as your reward. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, and that's not going to con conflict. Okay. You know, I've had dogs do scent work and agility and uh, disc, you know, frisbee. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It's it's an entirely they're using totally different like senses for all that. Yep, exactly. So, any other questions? Please ask me anything. And if you have any questions after too, where you're just like, I have a bad dog at home, you can ask me those questions later too. So, <laughs> I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. So for using the larger dish that you're putting the jar of mushrooms in, you suggest using that up until uh, you're out in the field and you're going for larger and larger distances. Yep. Another thing that you can do too, yeah, so you definitely want to fade away once you start going outside because you want to actually hide it. This is going to give it away. This is more just when you're initially pairing that, that scent, you know, um, with the reward. But another thing you can do too outside is let's say you have several of these identical containers. Um, I would recommend something that's not see-through, right? Something that kind of has some walls to it. You can set out several. 
right? So that would be considered like scent boxes, which is another way to do this, just requires more materials, where you would put out like a box here, and a box here, and a box here, and a box here, and you'd only put the scent in one. It kind of confuses them a little bit. So they're like, oh, okay, I've got to check all these boxes, but I only get rewarded if I find the right box. Um, so you can do that too. And that's kind of how they do nose work and scent detection stuff as well as using scent boxes. So, any other questions? questions, questions. What's a good place to buy dried mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm it's from mom's house. Yeah, these, I, I uh, don't buy mushrooms. I, I am gifted them. I'm a very lucky person. I don't really have to ask her them. She's just like, here, I have a lot of mushrooms. Please take them. Well, we will so. foray and we'll be finding different kinds. And, and then, you know, there are certain markets in town, the Asian marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys know, they're the bomb. Yeah. And um, Whole Natural Foods. Groceries. Natural Groceries. Has some Natural Groceries yeah. is great. They have uh, the smaller qu quantities, though. Yeah. They've got, like, the little bags. If you want a crap ton, go to Asian market. But they're also, some of the major markets are also getting hip to the fact that, yeah, people love mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Let's sell some. And once again, we will be finding them as they, it just, the season in the mountains is weird. It's compressed. I mean, there's certain areas, northern, northern California and the Pacific Northwest, I mean, it's mushroom season all year long. Pretty much, but here it gets really crazy during very specific times at very specific altitudes. And anyway, going off on a tangent there. All right, cool. Anything else, guys? See, we've got some puppy puppies going crazy over here, so we're gonna get them working. All right, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys.